Welcome to Call That Girl's Office 365 course. This is course number seven, and this week I bring back Tim Parkinson, our first course trainer who did the Teams course. Welcome, Tim. Hi, good evening, everybody. Hey, Tim is back just in time for us to learn about GDPR and talking about data and Office 365, what it is, who needs it. Honestly, I don't know that much about it, and uh, Tim has been the one who's been cheerleading it on all the Facebook groups and getting people all excited. And I gotta be honest, it's still something I'm not 100% sure about. So I, you know, I, I try to read it, but I don't live in the UK, which is where this new GDPR is taking place, right, Tim? Uh, not <laughs> technically right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. We'll get into that. We'll teach you, we'll teach you. Well, before Tim goes into it, which I'm sure he's gonna <laughs> teach us all a bunch of things, um, this course, I think, is going to be very valuable for everybody around the world because everybody has clients mm -hmm. in the UK, and I do as well. Um, but before we get started, I want to thank App River for sponsoring the course. There's going to be some notes down below. You can sign up uh, for our newsletter to get in on some goodies and freebies and discounts and fun things. But that will be in the notes in the YouTube below and on my website, callthatgirl.com. Okay, Tim. GDPR. Okay, GDPR. Right, so number one, GDPR. Do you know what it stands for, Lisa? Yes, General Data Protection Regulation. Correct, yes. Yay! So G GDPR, and by the way, I'm going to be reading from some notes, so if I'm not looking at the screen, that, that's why. Um, so, because there's a lot of um, TLAs, three-letter acronyms. Um, so, uh, there's, um, yeah, I'm going to make some notes so I get it right. So, first of all, I always say this to all of our clients, um, that I'm not a lawyer. Um, we know about GDPR. Um, we haven't had all the uh, the full kind of weeks worth of training on GDPR. Um, there are companies that we work with that are out there that do have all the proper, they've had all the interviews from uh, the Information uh, Commissioner's Office and they've had all the relevant lawyers vetting them and asking them questions. So that's the first thing I like to say. So whatever we're saying today is what we know. Um, please, you know, make sure that what we're saying is correct. As far as we're aware, everything is correct. So. If, we, if you take action on what we're saying and it's something not right, you can't sue us. That's right, because this, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, disclaimer. <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Informational only. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so, yeah, so GDPR stands for the General Data Protection Regulations. So in the UK, um, there was the Data Protection Act 1998. So that came into force and everything was made mainly kind of paper-based. These type of things didn't exist, so you didn't have smartphones, you didn't even have mobile phones in 1998, really. Um, the internet was pretty much dial-up, um, and that was about it. So they've been hanging around now for you know pretty much 20, 20 years. Um, so it's a big revamp, and uh, as you were saying earlier, it's not actually just it applies to the UK; it applies to dominantly Europe but it also applies to anybody outside of Europe who deals with any uh, person or person um, who is resident in the EU. So yeah, it is quite complicated. So it does affect uh, US companies, uh, Canadian companies, any company around the world who deals with any person that is a EU citizen or anybody that stores. European. EU, Europe, European, so that can be Spain, France, Germany, England, um, you know, the whole of the, there is, if you look at the website, I can give you some links to it, etc. I think we'll probably put those on the, on the, the YouTube when it gets published. Um, you can click on the links, it gives you a lot more information. I've got a, a load of links that people can look at and read uh, after the, um, the, the, the clip goes on to YouTube. So yeah, so it doesn't just affect the UK and Europe, it's anybody, especially you know, everywhere in the world. Um, just a second, Tim, just let everybody know that I've been seeing it now uh, in, every day in my inbox. People that I'm on their newsletter list, this is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm on their newsletter list, I'm getting a notification. You are. This is an awesome time to get off list, by the way. <laughs> Because if Definitely. you don't subscribe, you're not getting you're their not getting anymore. Exactly. And I've seen at least three already today. 
Mm -hmm. so it's kind of like nice. I'm like, oh, they're cleaning it up for me, which is kind of the point. Correct. And one of the points of the new GDPR regulations is that um, transparency. So, and also, you know, when you get, you subscribe to stuff and the box is already ticked to say, yes, I want to be added to your mailing list. They can't do that anymore. You need to be the other way around. So you need to actually say, yes, I want to subscribe to this. You can't auto subscribe people um, if you're purchasing something from them they can no longer say oh by the way when you purchase something we're going to put you on our mailing list there has right. to be a specific yes I want to know information on your mailing list um, even to the point if you have a um, someone who has subscribed to your mailing list about dogs for example you can't then say oh okay well I've got this information here about cats I'm going to email these people who subscribed about dogs about cats in layman's terms, gotcha. you have to, you you can't multiple subscribe people. You have to subscribe them and tell them the exact reason why you're subscribing them to that mailing list. If you then decide to have a different mailing list about a different subject, cats, you need to then ask them again, would you like to be on my mailing list about cats? But how do you do that? You have to email them to ask them. Yes, you do. <laughs> That's, yeah, this is what a lot of companies are falling foul of now. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's going to be a very interesting few days or few well, months stroke years. I'm just going to let everybody know today is May 23rd, and I'm going to try to get uh -huh. this out today if I can because it goes into effect on the 25th. Correct, right? this Friday. So I'm going to try to get this out tonight the best I can. Now, the second thing I want to tell folks is that my newsletters, I've already scrubbed them out and cleaned them already, but I have to do it again, I think, right, Tim? Mm -hmm. If you want to cover this later, that's fine. But I do newsletters. I have clients in the EU, and yep. so I have to, like, give them one last shot to subscribe to my new one. Correct. You, I can't email them anymore. Nope. So here's what I'm going to do, you guys, is I'm going to take it as a time to clean up my whole newsletter list for everybody mm -hmm. because I'm like, honestly, I want to refresh I'm paying for 5,000 people when I might only need to pay for 2,500. Correct, yeah. And the, the, the whole mailing list thing, the MailChimp and that kind of stuff, uh, whatever systems people are using, um, there's everyone saying, well, I've got this mailing list of 25,000 people. It Normally, I don't know what the the normal is, but it's, it's probably around about, I would say, 10%, if less, yeah. actually want to be on that list. So... <laughs> Why email 25,000 people who don't want to know about your products? Why not have a good clear out? And then you can really concentrate on the people that do want to know about your products. Right. That'll uh, clear out a lot of your response links. rates are going to be higher. Have you ever, okay, uh, before we even get going, what about LinkedIn people? How's that going to all work? Ah, oh, LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be another interesting one. Um, I have a lot of UK people, a lot of EU people. And the thing is, is that LinkedIn allows you to export your contacts mm -hmm. and put them into mailing lists. Yep. So that's going to be a game changer too. It is. Yeah, definitely. So there's, there's a lot of things where, like the, the main one for me is the um, domain registry. So ICANN, et cetera, you know, where you can look up the registrant of a domain name. So if you're moving someone to Office 365 and they have no idea who registered the domain, you are no longer going to be able to find that information about the person who registered that domain. That's oh, wow. going. Yeah, exactly. That, that's a big one for IT people. There's a whole, if you look on the internet now, there's a whole load of wrangling about the, um, whatever the um, governing body for, is it ICANN, I think it is? So the whole governing oh, body have oh. basically come to the table are very, very late, and they're now trying to extend to allow them to keep this information past Friday. Well, so that's going to be another movie? interesting one. What about when that's you go to is, Yeah, that's exactly that. Who is is going to disappear? So wait a second. If I go to who is and they didn't buy private, it's not going to show up anyway. So why buy private anymore? Exactly. <laughs> There's no point. <laughs> what I think they're going to start to do is to anonymize people's email addresses. So it'll still have their email address, but it'll be one two three four five six seven eight nine oh at whatever domain, which will then forward onto their Office three six five account, whatever it is. So that information is then not public, but people can still contact them. But you still won't be able to see people's um, address, telephone number, that kind of information. Wow! So no more snooping. No more snooping. I know pain. <laughs> I love snooping too. So do I. I think I think every IT person does. You know, find out and find out who's got this domain and where it's registered, etc. It's part of the job, isn't it? 
Yeah, it is. Well, first of all, for my client stuff, but I just, you know, like seeing who owns stuff anyway. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I found some neat stuff in that. Who is? Yep. But, all right. Well, Very that, so that's going away. The newsletter stuff, and we still got to think about LinkedIn. So those three have covered off your script. We haven't even talked mm -hmm. about your script yet. <laughs> <laughs> nope, exactly. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead um, and go on with your stuff? So, so really, you know, I've got, uh, I have a, a 72 um, page PowerPoint presentation. I'm not going to do it today, <laughs> by yeah. the way. Um, yeah. So that takes me half a day to run through. So we do that with, uh, with our clients that want like a full GDPR audit. So we run through all that with them to explain what it is, where it's come from, what people should be thinking about, and the main points for GDPR. GDPR is an absolutely huge, huge, huge um, subject. So again, people say, oh, I'm GDPR compliant. There is no such thing as being GDPR compliant. There's no rubber stamp that says I'm compliant. It's a continual process. So when you have a new member of staff, you need to give them some training. Um, you need to retrain your staff every six months so they know what to do. Um, oh any new system that you have, you need to make sure that the data within that system is stored in the correct way. If you have a new supplier, you need to make sure that your supplier, who is technically your what's called your data processor, so if you have a, uh, a marketing company that you give your marketing list to, your marketing company is a data processor, you need to make sure that they are adhering to GDPR regulations because if they lose your data, so you give them an Excel spreadsheet of your clients, they put it on a pen stick and leave it on a train, you're still liable. And the costs for, um, for this are quite high, which is what brings everybody's attention. So the maximum fine you could have is 4% of gross annual, sorry, gross international turnover. So that's turnover, not profit or up to 20 million euros, whatever that equivalent is in US dollars, um, in fines. Wow. And Whichever includes, is larger. That includes me, little call that girl. It does. I could get fined if I send yep. someone a newsletter Correct. That, that said dot hotmail dot UK. Yep. If somebody wants to go down that line, you may not, it's a possibility, you know, you wouldn't get, I highly doubt that you're going to get Four million, uh, sorry, 20 million euro fine, but it is possible. So it's mainly aimed at the big guys just to, it's really just to scare people to say, look, you know, we're not really kind of messing around with this now. It's GDP, it's the, you know, the new regulations and they do actually have teeth. They will bite you if, if you don't apply. Well, what are they going to do with all the Nigerian prince emails then? That you guys get? <laughs> I think they will disappear. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but for me, you know, going back to talking about Office 365 and, you know, we did the, 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 the last presentation on Teams, um, we've started to use Teams everywhere for all of our clients now. When we get a new client, we say to our client, look, we're not going to talk to you over email. We're going to talk to you over Teams because you can then control that data. Sending emails out from your company with information in is not secure. You can get spammed. You know, if, you have, if you're not doing things properly, your email could be hacked. You could, you know, if you haven't got your username and password secure, anybody can be logging into your email account and extracting that information. Yeah. And if they do that, you can get fined. You, you know, you can be reported to, well, in the UK, it's the ICO, uh, or the relevant governing body is in whatever country that you're in. Uh, a lot of people in the U.S. say to me, well, I'm in the U.S., they can't touch us because it's, it's not, um, there's no regulatory bodies over here. There actually is. Um, again, we'll put this on one of the links that I'll give you. Um, the ICO in the U.K. and the relevant companies in whatever country it is in the EU have these agreements set up with a lot of international companies, not all countries, not of international countries, rather, not all of them. Uh, again, we'll give you the list. Um, but they have an agreement so that we can actually get hold of people in the US and find them and take them to court, et cetera. So they're not out of reach. Yeah, no one's safe anymore. No one's safe, exactly. You know, I actually got an email from MailChimp directly, not even having an account with them anymore. They, Because they, I think I'm on so many MailChimp lists. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't recall what it said, but uh, I just threw it away. But, you know, the, here, the whole thing is, is that this all started, what was it, about a month ago? You said something to me about it, and we joked. Mm, 
Yeah. And you picked on me and you're like, yep. you're kidding, right? I'm like, don't pick on me. I don't pay attention to you guys. <laughs> but then it was almost instantly I started seeing it like yeah. hotcakes everywhere. Mm -hmm. I was like, God, Tim, I just kind of feel stupid. But, you know, when something doesn't, when you don't think you have to pay attention, you let it go. But now I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I got actually a lot of things out there that are outside of the, the USA. Mm -hmm. Like I do international remote support. Yep. I've got clients in Australia. I've got clients in France. I mean, I've got them in England and Scotland. And I'm like, I got two days now to think about what I'm going to do here. Now, mm -hmm. I have their data in my ticket systems. Is yep. that safe? Uh, right. Well, moving on, moving on from that. Yeah, let's start to discuss that. So, okay. um, so uh, we know what GDPR is. We've given you a very brief overview of that it affects everybody. Uh, it's replacing the Data Protection Act 1998, which is equivalent in the UK. Um, so I'm just going from my notes now. Uh, another thing to consider is, uh, as well is that different parts of the EU have different rules, and this is called derogation, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So there's uh, the main GDPR regulations that are in effect across the EU and, and worldwide, but each country has a slightly different subset of those regulations. So some we deal with clients over in Spain, so they have their government has specified that there's a slightly different rules that you have to apply to in their jurisdiction. So every single country will have their own slightly different regulations. Oh no. Um, yeah, it makes it even more fun. Uh, so, and the next thing I've got on my list here is that the, there are six principles of GDPR. So number one is requiring transparency on handling and use of personal data. Number two is limiting personal data processing to be specified and it has to be for legitimate purposes. Number three, limiting personal data collection and storage to intended purpose. Number four, enabling individuals to correct or request deletion of the personal data. Number five, limiting the storage of personally identifiable data for as long as necessary for its intended purpose and ensuring personal data is protected using the appropriate security practices. And I'm quoting from the uh, ICO website here. Okay. Oh, let me think um, of all the ways I have data hiding. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just think of this first. My Office 365 contacts, those notes in those contacts. Mm -hmm. Yep. A lot of my clients so have contact notes in there that's data. Correct. <laughs> Correct. So, so this all comes back down to um, this is protecting people, um, what everybody calls PII, personal identifiable information. So that is information about a, a living, breathing person. So you, me, etc. If it's information about, I don't know, a tablet or a mobile phone or a company, that's not an actual living, breathing person. So GDPR does not apply to those to that data. It's only about you or me. Personal identifiable information can be a telephone number, an email address. Uh, it can be someone's nationality. It can be something to do with their genetic, genetic makeup. It can be anything from sexual orientation, all those types of information. So if you hold that information, you need to be really, really careful about securing that data. So even things like an IP address can identify a person. So if you've got remote monitoring software, which records IP addresses that you connected to, that is included with GDPR. Oh, okay. Well, do you even want to go down that story? Because in a technician's guide to GDPR, which we could call this class. Yep. <laughs> uh, okay. So let's start with uh, ticketing software. Mm -hmm. First of all, I have a software company that's a ticket system that holds my data. Yep. I type it into that. So they're responsible now for the GDPR portion. They are, yes. Me. Okay, so. Mm, I, I, nope, you're not right there. So you, you're putting your information from your clients into their system. Yep. If they were to lose your data and it was to be compromised, you would be responsible okay. for that because they are what's called a data processor. Uh, true, okay. Okay, okay so. so you need to speak to each one of your suppliers that handle your data. So your ticketing system or your mailing list people, whoever it may be, even your accountant, because they'll be holding information about your staff, um, potentially you know, relevant information. You need to make sure that they're handling your data correctly. 
Correct. Um, and there are some um, some questionnaires that we have that we can uh, we use with our clients to say, right, you know, these are the questions that you need to ask your suppliers to make sure that they're handling your data correctly. And um, a lot of this information, a lot of GDPR is, excuse my French, but it's a lot of ass covering. Um, so, you know, it's just making sure that you're covered if the worst was to happen and you're passing the blame onto somebody else. So you've done your due diligence to say, well, I've protected our data. We've checked with this company. They said, yes, they were protecting everything. We've got it in writing to say, yes, they're, they've got multi-factor authentication, they've got security, they've got encryption, you know, this type of thing. And if they haven't, well, you can then sue, you'll still get sued, but then you can counter sue them for breach. Right. Okay, so um, let's just start by saying if anybody is in the US only and does not have any outside UK, EU clients, mm -hmm. they don't need to be concerned. Correct. Yes. It's only if you support people outside of the United States and over on across the pond on that side. Exactly. Okay. Now let's start with the ticketing system. I so let's say I've got a client from two years ago. I put a ticket in from them. Do I have to delete that ticket information now if I have personal stuff in there about the, about their own outlook? So um, GDPR states that you uh, are only supposed to hold on to data uh, for as long as you need it. Okay, well, I need it because I have to reference back. Okay, so that's fine. So as part of your GDPR piece of work, you um, there is an assessment that you do, and then you state those kind of facts to say, right, you know, I need, I am going to keep in this inf be keeping this information for X amount of time because I need to refer back to it um, for whatever. Now, um, there are reasons why you would be required to keep information for longer than that. So GDPR is at the bottom of the pile. So if you have, for example, financial information for is it the IRS that you guys have over there? Um, so for IRS purposes um, or for HMRC, which is the equivalent in the UK, so they require you to keep records for, I think it's five years. Mm. Um, so if you have to keep records for five years, you have to keep records for five years and that is exempt from GDPR because right. there's another body above you that says you need to keep this reg these this information. Um, also medical purposes as well. Medical companies have to keep documents for a lot longer. And again, that is above and above GDPR right. regulations. So you have to keep it. Okay. Well, okay. So my ticket system, I'm just gonna, you know, I think I got to think about the handful of clients I do have, which isn't many, but most mm -hmm. of their stuff in the ticket system, I do need for reference. So I'm okay yep. there. Now, okay. people that do RMM monitoring software and the IP address thing, that's going to be important for the techs listening here. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have other products that manage stuff. It's similar to the ticketing, but it's not ticketing. It's, you know, the management of the computers and things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say someone helps someone and the, they've got a big client over there. What did they just a few simple steps they need to do to clean up or to, uh, like you said, document that they need that? Mm -hmm. right. So yeah, they document that they need it and how they're going to be handling that data. Say, so, right, okay, we have this client. Uh, our internal procedure is that we keep this information for X amount of time. And then after that amount of time, that information is removed from the system. Okay. So you have to have ways of doing that. Um, and then you have to have a way of going, this information is two years old and our policy is that we remove it after two years. We're going to remove it. So basically each company, like a tech company like ourselves, we just need to write up our own little GDPR little guide of yep. things that we're did for our UK and EU clients mm -hmm. to be compliant, which for me, I'm looking at simple. I do ticketing and I have my own data on my computer and I have social media. I think that's the three that I need to take care of. Mm -hmm. I have client data in my computer. I've got actually, um, like most technicians, I've have data from their outlook. Yep. I've got that I should probably be destroying anyway. Correct. I've got uh, social media contacts, uh, messages in LinkedIn. I've got Facebook. I mean, our so Facebook, fa tech. Facebook is <laughs> it's a slightly different situation for social media because you're publishing that information. So you're putting that information out on there on Facebook. People are viewing that information and they're subscribing or following you on Facebook. So right. 
by doing that, they're giving you consent to have their information. And if they want to remove that consent, all they do is they unfollow or unshare or unlike whatever it may well be. So they have that transparency and they have the ability to control what information you see about people. Right. So for example, if you're a friend on Facebook, you see more information when you unfriend somebody or they unfriend you, you can no longer see their telephone number or whatever it is. That's down to them. So really Facebook, et cetera, is, no, don't quote me on this, but I think it's probably outside of outside of the remit for a lot of places, a lot of people as well. And also, if you're doing it personally, it's person to person. That again falls outside of GDPR regulations. I think LinkedIn is LinkedIn is a similar because if you put it on your profile, you're giving it out to the LinkedIn universe. So mm -hmm. there's, I mean, you can hide yourself and be anonymous, but exactly. Okay, I think we're stretching on that one. So next yeah. is uh, personal data on my computer. Mm -hmm. This is a huge one for you, and you actually joked before in pre-show, you said, oh, everything here is on my tablet, and here's me, about this wave thing that I'm going to hope, not for EU and GDPR, but I just was trying to simplify writing stuff down in this wave thing, and then I can yep. microwave it, and it's gone. Exactly. Yeah. But you also got with that though, you've got to consider, you know, I know that's sat on your desk at the minute, but a lot of people will have a notepad such as that. It's great that you can stick it in the microwave and it removes the data. But what happens when you're leaving a meeting with that, with that um, notepad, you're sat on a train, your handbag gets snatched or you leave it on a train. That is a data breach. Oh my God. They are, gosh, they are getting yeah. hardcore. They are getting hardcore, which is why, you well, know, I can show you this. This is now my notepad. Right. I don't know if you can see that on the screen. Yeah. So that is a Samsung uh, Tab 3 with a, a stylus, all digital. So this is now linked into my Teams. I have one note linked into my Teams. So the notes for the show are in this, are in the Call That Girl Biz uh, Teams group that we created. Yep. So my OneNote notes are in here. They're now shared with you. So my data that I hold on you is completely transparent. You can see all the data that I have on you. If you wanted to, you could go and delete that data right now, and I wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Okay. Complete transparency. And this is how we work with our clients now. Yeah, Tim, if you guys haven't watched the first course, uh, go ahead and, and watch that. The, the Microsoft Teams is really, um, it's a hard sell for me to my clients because my clients are small teams. Mm -hmm. I, I try to sell them on the chat feature, if anything. Like, you can at least chat and not send each other emails like, hey, did you get that sales update and did we land yep. that client? But I think uh, for bigger teams, it's going to be valuable, not only for the GDPR, but for just uh, keeping things off email. Correct, yeah. To the teamwork. But that, check out yep. the course. It's a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we've actually started doing since that, um, we've actually started categorizing all of our teams now with a, um, a word at the start to help all, because we find it now we've, we've probably upwards of 40, 50 different teams for various different things with clients. Oh. Um, so we now have, um, we start all of ours with C-U-S-T underscore, then the customer name. So we know that's externally shared with a customer. We have I-N-T underscore with the cust same customer name potentially. So we've got one section for externally sharing with a customer. We've got one section for internally sharing with the cost, uh, wow. with ourselves. We then have PROJ for projects. Um, you know, so we wow. categorize them all, and we keep all of our information now in Teams. Prime example is when we finish a project, or because all that information is contained within that team. Once it's done, and we go, okay, after two months, we need to get rid of this data. We just delete the team; it's gone. Yeah, and Teams doesn't have a backup yet, so. Bye-bye. Exactly. So it is definitely bye-bye. I think there's still the 30 days which you can retention that you can have um, so you can recover it. But, yeah, in effect, it's gone. I think that's great. They might not want to have a backup for Teams for that purpose. Like, it's just gone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I got to say, I was in a, a, is this an off topic here for people that have Slack. Uh, was it Slack? Slack. So can you import Slack into Teams? Um, personally, I've never used Slack. I know okay. basic features of it. Um, it's very similar to Teams. I'm, I'm sure there will be somebody out there who will be able to say, yes, you can do a migration from Slack into Teams. I wouldn't have a clue whether it's possible or not. I had a client yesterday that I was super impressed. His Slack channel was insane. It was mm -hmm. really impressive. And I'm like, that's what yours is probably like in the team. Yeah. Not all that, yeah. 
Well, I'm not into it yet. I still am trying though. And those that are that need to, you should check out that course. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a good one. We're gonna do a part two, I think. Still, right? We are. Yes, we are. Yes. So, and there's still the uh, um, the the teams group, which I've actually got a couple of people in my email now that I need to go and invite to the team. I've had another couple of emails in the past couple of days to invite in. So, uh, yeah. So it's uh, it's all good. Cool. Right then. So, um, where were we up to, Lisa? So I we. Know. I think we're going to talk about data on the computer, but to be oh, frank, that's right. To be frank with you, I've got so much de uh, hoarding to do that, um, and since I'm not under the GDR compliant, you know, area so much, I'm going to probably not go through my computer and do mm -hmm. everything. Like okay. I think you told me to do. <laughs> I'm <laughs> well, not doing that. The key thing here for people's local computers, now we, we do this all the time for our clients now by default, we obviously we do it ourselves, is yes, you're right, you know, if you don't need the information, just get rid of it, you know, have a damn good clear out of your Outlook. I now have set on my Outlook, any emails over six months old, just get deleted. Oh my God. So we actually now use uh, Microsoft 365 E3. Um, so we actually now tag all of our emails so that if it's financial information, I can set a tag on that email for retention to retain it for five years. After five years, that email or that piece of information automatically deletes itself. If I delete that piece of information, it comes back. I can tell you that there's many of my clients that would never go for either one of those. <laughs> they, <laughs> they have email from 1996 and 97 still. But but this is a, this is exactly right. You know, a lot of people do they they hoard information, and that's perfectly fine. They just need to know what risks are um, are, are there if that was to be the case. So the other thing that a very simple thing that people can do, and we do this uh, all the time, and it's 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 actually quite a good upsell for a lot of people is um, BitLocker. So I'm assuming everybody knows what BitLocker does. Um, so in a nutshell, it encrypts your hard drive. Yeah. And it, we can also encrypt your external drives as well. So if you've got if you've got a pen stick or something like along those lines that has data on it, with BitLocker you can encrypt that pen stick. So if you leave it on a train or you drop it out of your pocket or if you're keyring, people will have to put a password in to gain access to that data. Nice. So it's very, very simple to protect that data because if you don't do that and you lose it and it's got a database on there, you are liable for a data breach. And technically, you need to report that. So, <laughs> it's kind of funny you smile with that word data breach. It's, kind of like, <laughs> it's a data breach. <laughs> data breach is, is, is really a word that kind of scares people, and it's where, it's where the money comes from. <laughs> I know. Well, we all make money from people we who do. get hacked and people that get fished. And most of the people watching this are technicians. And yes, mm -hmm. when people do bad things, we make money from it. So. Yeah. The GDPR, though, I don't want to consider that as something to make money from, is the, the stuff Tim is teaching is, you know, valuable information for us to know and for uh, people that can actually sell it, because you're selling it as a service now. Like people can um, yeah. do it, comp get you, not get them compliant, because it's never going to be 100%, but to be your, like, you know, you're like the GDPR tech for them. Of sorts, mm -hmm. right? yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So we go into a company, we will sit down, we give them a presentation um, for however long, talk to their staff, and especially talk to the board of directors, because it's really something that the board of directors need to be on board with. Um, talk to them, explain what it is, explain the risks, explain how they can mitigate some of those risks. Yeah. And then out of the back of that, there's normally a piece of work to secure their computers. Um, we had one client which was on uh, G Suite, and they're kind of going, well, G Suite doesn't do that. And we go, no, it doesn't, but Office 365 does. So we've actually I've done a migration from them and put them onto a um, Microsoft 365 E3 plan. So they've got all the litigation hold, they've got all the security, they've got um, MDM, so they can protect all their mobile devices. So even with that, you know, that's quite a hefty piece of work. That's a few yeah. thousand pounds worth of work there just from doing a presentation. Yeah, so G Suite is not GDR compliant? As far as I'm aware, it's not fully okay. GDPR compliant. I'm thinking money, money, money for tax. Yeah, exactly. That's, so a, that's a golden you, nugget right there because when you've been talking about the E5 stuff, the retention and mm -hmm. all that, 
I didn't even I don't even support G Suite admin for the most part, but that's good to know. Yeah, so I I wouldn't say it's one hundred percent not compliant, but the the things that you need to do to make it compliant are like you need full auditing, um, you need that for retention, that type of thing. It just for me it it doesn't exist. I know there have been some recently there has been some leaps and bounds with G Suite. And there has been some new features that have been uh, publicized recently, which I can see it's starting to catch up. Uh, but currently, um, there is uh, Mike, Microsoft Office 365 actually has its own GDPR dashboard if you go for the enterprise plans. So you can actually do all of your data access requests directly within Office 365. You can do an e-discovery search to... Um, so another thing that I will come on to in a second is that um, even though we're now protecting data with encrypting people's hard drives in case their machines get stolen, mm -hmm. people still have the right to, uh, to action what's called a request for information. So anybody can send us a request to say, please, can you tell me all the information that you hold on me? And we then have... Don't quote me on this. I think it's 30 days to provide that information to that person. What? Yeah. For no reason, they just can request it and you have to give it? It, it can't be for no reason. They have to have a reason why they want to make that request. Uh, but again, I can put some links um, on, the, um, uh, on YouTube wow. for you um, on the um, information request. Wow. Or request for information, I should say. Well, I can see, you know, if let's say you got some stalker and, and they're trying to get through you through something, you'd be like, oh, let me see what my stalker can find, you know? Yeah, well, it's only it's only business-related information that you have to provide. Yeah, so if it's cool. one of your clients That's and it's only information you hold on them, so, you know, technically you could kind of delete that information and say, well, I've only got this and then rem just give them what's left for you. Right. And the, you, there's also... Um, you could only have to provide them information that is relevant. So if you have some confidential information on one of your clients about a meeting or whatever it may well be, there are mitigating circumstances where you can say, well, I'm not going to give that information to that client because it's confidential information between us on that client. Um, so you then have to state this is the reason why this information hasn't gone, hasn't been given. So it can get into quite legal Kind of side of things and i try not to touch that um no exactly so um so yeah so the the key thing for me which we and i would say to people look you know although you're like you yourself was saying that you you don't want to have a tidy up at the minute that's perfectly fine the key thing in that instance would be to make sure that your data that you hold on your clients on your desktop machine or your laptop or your mobile um, even you know you might have details from a client on an email which is on your mobile right. you lose your mobile and your mobile hasn't got a pin number and it's not encrypted that is a data breach so the key thing here is um, now to make sure that you have BitLocker installed on your machines which takes away a lot of the pain so even though you do have information you're protecting that information because you're holding on to it so it can't be compromised if, heaven forbid, you were to get broken into and your PC or laptop was to get stolen or to leave your um, device on a train or what have you. So if you have Windows 10 Professional, it's really simple. You just right-click, enable BitLocker, follow the wizard, and let it sit there for a couple of hours. It encrypts your hard drive. Job sorted. That information is protected. I'm Somebody... Good. Yeah, exactly. And if, you, and if you haven't got Windows 10 Professional, unfortunately, you know, you probably do need to upgrade to Windows 10 Professional. If you're an IT person, I would say you should have that anyway. Um, I'm not, though. <laughs> I'll be honest. I'm always honest. I bought my computer at Costco. So that's uh, a good deal. And let me see what I got on this bad boy. I have Windows 10 Home. Oh, okay. But this is my second machine, so. So yeah, definitely um, advise you if you can, if you want to get upgraded. If you're a Microsoft partner, you actually get free upgrades to Windows 10 Professional. So you can just download the key from your partner portal, bang the key, and it upgrades you. You can then activate cool. BitLocker on your machine. 
Well, I'm getting a new computer for my new office, so it'll be pretty. Yeah. So this is what a lot of our clients do. They'll go, oh, hang on a minute, you know, why is that computer so expensive? And they go, well, I can get this one cheaper from, yeah, Costco or from Argos or wherever they want to buy it from or right. Amazon. And a lot of the consumer machines, they don't have Windows 10 Professional. They come with Windows 10 Home, and that's why they're cheaper. So that's another technical tip for those that yep. need to sell. Make sure they it's get the right Windows version. Good upsell. As that means you can charge for like a, a Dell laptop as opposed to a horrible Acer laptop or something along those lines that you get from. Sorry to anybody that likes Acer's. Um, so, uh, that's so, yeah. That's a question. What's the cheapest laptop? And there people are always like, oh, we hate hearing that. The cheapest. Yeah. Well, my computer was not the cheapest but it was mm -hmm. the best one I could find that I got me everything I wanted. If I yep. had known though that I needed pro back two years ago when I bought this, I probably would have looked differently. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. That's a good tip. Mm -hmm. but it's a good tip as well. Cause you, you know, if you can get a price on windows 10 professional, you can then put your margin on top of that and install it for your clients. So and it, it is a money spinner. We've had one of our clients that needed 15, 17 machines upgrading from Windows 10 home to Windows 10 professional. So it can be really kind of lucrative. And, you know, it's not you wanting to try and make money out of people. You're going, well, you need to do this, and these are the reasons. So it's kind of the sale is already done for you. Well, for those in the, anywhere in the world, we, Tim was also going to do a, a video on security and how we are leaving money off the table when it comes to mm -hmm. setting up office. Then we just let the clients go. And we're yep. like, we got to do the other things to close the sale better, like secure their stuff and two-step and MFA and mm -hmm. training and how to wipe a device and how to back up data from a client who gets terminated. I mean, that's all money. Yep, definitely. It's hard to get, but I think that the better we are as techs with that stuff, the more we'll make, the better the, the clients are. And now you can add on GDPR training. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I won't be probably doing that, but, you know, um yeah that's a whole new thing that's happening it's gonna be big it is it's big and i must admit i actually quite like it because it's making people think about their data right. and to stop them from hoarding their data and actually going actually do i do i really need that <sighs> just get rid of it yeah. it's it's really you know it's a it's a it's a, excuse my french again but it's a bloody good cleanup that a lot of people right. need <laughs> well i think everybody hoards and loves hoarding and i think that's probably good and I, do you ever see this coming over to the U.S.? Um, Microsoft, oh, I've seen in reports from Microsoft that they're trying to make it a global thing, which, you know, you've got things like Safe Harbor across there in the U.S. and stuff like that. So there's similar kind of things happening. Um, okay. But Microsoft want to rename it to be Global Data Protection Act as opposed to uh, General Data Protect Protection Act. It's called the Microsoft Sorry, data. Uh, not Data Protection Act, um, Data <laughs> data regulations well why don't they just put their own name on it which they want to do <laughs> <laughs> microsoft data protection exactly but i think you know all these things are good because there's, there's two sides to this right. you know we're looking at it from a technical perspective looking at it from a personal perspective if i'm giving somebody data my own personal data i want to make sure that they're looking after it right um you know there's well, there's, there's companies in in the uk who have um, there's a company called Talk Talk in the UK who's a mobile phone and an uh, ISP. They lost thousands and thousands of people's personal credit card details and personal details. And you don't want that. You know, it, it's, it, it is really scary that your data could be sat on someone's unencrypted hard drive in the back of their car. Right. You know what, Adam brought up in a, la in a course that we did that Microsoft just gives us the products, but the data is ours and they don't do anything with it. But their data, our data is housed on their servers. Mm -hmm. So this is where it can be kind of crossed over. It's housed on their servers. So they're not responsible for anything for GDPR though. Because you own the data, they just like store it, right? Correct. They have to have their own... Um security systems in place so your data isn't physically stolen now there is um there is an extra license that you can get for office 365 which uh let me remember what it's called um i think it's called oh, vault or the name the name goes off my head now i think it's called lock locker i think it's called which basically means you can provide microsoft with your own ssl certificate 
which they will encrypt your data with your SSL certificate. So even they can't access your data. Wow. Okay, yeah. well, that's for so if you're really uber kind of cautious about your data, if you're you know you want to don't even want governments to be able to access your data, you can provide your own SSL certificate so that only you have access to your data, even if someone else wanted to access it. I know, for, I know a few people that probably like that. Oh, yeah, I do as well. <laughs> <laughs> people you won't really want to cross. Uh, no, no, I have a I've seen some people encrypt all their PST files. Every mm -hmm. single one that's stored on an encrypted uh, drive, they don't encrypt the PST. They password protect it and then put it on an encrypted drive. Yep. And that's, then to be fair, that's fairly standard these days. Yeah. And that that's a person that travels a lot, though, so I can see why. They mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely. I'd be I'd definitely be um um in agreement with that. Yeah. Double 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 protected. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And what else? We got a few. Okay, minutes. so um, really, I think that's the pretty much a high level of what people need to be looking out for, and where there could be quite large upsells. Um, we now recommend uh, we don't actually sell Office three six five Business Premium anymore. Our default offering now is uh, something called Microsoft three six five. So Microsoft 365 <laughs> Business. Oh, so I don't know if you're aware of that one. Yes. Okay, Isn't that so the one that ties your computer into it now. So it's um, your Windows and Office 365 bundled. It doesn't have to, but another thing that we're now upselling to our clients is, like I say, the Microsoft 365 uh, Business, or if they want to go further down the line, is the Microsoft 365 Enterprise plans, which are absolutely awesome but they are quite expensive mm, let me just tell you um, i don't think microsoft has enough plans to purchase <laughs> you should try you should try some dynamics plans dynamics plans are oh it's just ridiculous there's over a hundred different licenses oh. that you can buy for dynamics 365 it's crazy and they well, keep on changing the prices i can't even keep up with what i have to do so here's the thing about the microsoft 365 Mm -hmm. that, that's probably another course on its own too but what I've yep. read about it is it ties your windows into office 365 it bundles it of sorts right it would yep. cover your windows 10 pro license right so to clarify on that um, if you have uh, windows 7 or windows 8 or windows 8.1 professional with Microsoft 365 you can upgrade that 7 or 8 machine to windows 10 if you've got Windows 10, sorry, Windows 10 Home, or you've got Windows uh, 7 Home or Windows 8 Home, you can't upgrade to Windows 10 Professional. You still have to buy the Professional license. I'm so lucky. I'm stuck with it. Mm -hmm. But this computer I have is going to be my home computer, so I'm fine with that. I'm buying a new computer. The new okay. one I can set up with a Microsoft 365 and start yeah. playing with all those toys. Exactly. So what I'd advise in in that instance would be, um, we now do this as default again, we use something called uh, Windows um, uh, Azure. So everybody's heard of Microsoft Azure. So we use Azure Active Directory. So when we set a new machine up, um, you know, you go through the wizard and now talks you, et cetera. Um, there's an option in there, do you want to sign on with a personal account or a business account? If you have a Windows, sorry, if you have a Office 365 account, you get this free. All you do is you just click on um, a business account when you're setting things up. You type in your Office 365 username and password. It then joins your machine to Azure Active Directory. What that means is, is that you get the same login for Office 365 and the same login for your computer. If you have a laptop and you leave it on a train, all you need to do is reset your Office 365 password. You can no longer log into that computer even if they were to know what your password was. And it links everything together. Again, Tim, another course. Another course. This, this could go on and <laughs> on. I have a course list of about 40, and Tim is the one who keeps adding on because it never- Sorry. Happens. No, I enjoy it, but to me, because <laughs> I just do some things, you know, I'm like, okay, so there's so many more things to learn, it never ends. It's like an encyclopedia. It just keeps going and deep, deeper and deeper. I, exactly. I, I am going to just put a little note at the end of the show here that we just touched upon Microsoft 365, and mm -hmm. we can definitely put that on the agenda for another course because 
I, I, I need to know more about it too. Cause I sell, I don't sell myself. I have clients buy stuff though. I'm consulting for them mm -hmm. they buy it on their own. I think the Azure is a little too much for a two person team. You know, uh, not really. I, I, you know, I've done it for single entities and it, it just makes people's lives easier because at the minute you have a, you'd have a, a local admin account on your machine, which could have a password. Then you've got your office 365 password and the two are never the same or they oh, technically well, aren't the that. same. That's where the problem starts, too many passwords. <laughs> exactly. So doing it with uh, Azure Active, Di Active Directory, you have the same login for your PC right. and the same login for Office 365. Yeah. So when you log into your computer and open up Outlook, it, it single signs you on to, um, to your account, so you don't have to enter that second password. Well, here's what I'm already seeing a lot, is when we go to activate the um, Office software, it says, do you want to add this to your Windows? Mm -hmm. And it says yes on the right side and skip on the left in tiny little letters. Yep. Microsoft Marketing Tactics 101 is make sure you check everything because I've already seen clients get hijacked into that. They didn't know what they were doing. I always say skip for now because I don't want to be responsible if they get locked out of their computer with their 20 zillion passwords. I don't know mm -hmm. what they signed up with and it's so confusing out there. There's never going to be a nice streamline of how this all works. Never. And these people have home office 365 too, by the way. And it's right. Okay. That. It's bad. Mm -hmm. Anyway, as my tip is just say skip for now until you know what you're doing, because I don't even know what, the, have you even seen that? Uh, must admit I haven't because we, yeah. we only really deal with, with That's business it. clients. So uh, I don't really often see that. Well, a lot of people watching here support people with Home Office 365, and that is where I don't want to get entangled in what website password is in mm -hmm. your Windows now, and oh, uh, it, it actually, because uh, I don't even keep people's passwords unless they request me to, which is probably against GDPR. <laughs> Definitely is, yes. <laughs> and it's for your security as well, If as long as you're storing those passwords securely, if they're not secure... <laughs> <laughs> You've got, you know, someone could get that database of passwords and they've got carte blanche across all of your clients. I um, only do if they a lot of, you. <laughs> yeah, a lot of GDPR as well. It's not a financial loss for people. It's a reputational loss. If you, if we were to lose uh, one of our, some of our clients' data, they may not sue us, but right. our reputation would be severely affected. Look at uh, um, Cambridge Analytica, which was the big thing. I'm assuming you've probably heard of them in the news, yeah. a UK company. That company has now folded, not because, uh, yeah, exactly. In the past few weeks, that company has now folded, not because they um, didn't have any money. It's basically all of their clients said, sorry, we're not using you anymore. And they all left because of, the, um, of their reputation and the company folded within weeks. That is crazy. Well, crazy, but true. I read about that. Don't worry. I read all about it. It was uh, here. Mm -hmm. All right, Mister. What else? We got a couple more minutes left, and that'll be um, a whole show. We did a lot. I think of that's fun. about it, really, from my perspective. You know, I could probably talk all night, as you know. I like I love talking, but um, um, I think that's pretty much covered the the highlights of GDPR. Uh, so yeah, I think that's in that's enough, really, for me for the time being. Okay. Well, let's close with this note that there's going to be some more GDPR stuff coming out. Uh, we're not going to spoil it for anybody, but there's a spoiler. And, um, you know, is that PowerPoint you made ever going to be for sale? <laughs> Could well be. I think Could well be. I have a PowerPoint for sale, and it sells just fine. Yep. So I'm just leaving it out there as an opportunity because putting up together a PowerPoint is a lot of time. Oh, it's a lot of time, it, yeah. It takes a lot of time, construction, and all that stuff, and I'm just leaving that as a little tip for you. Mm -hmm. and, you know, people would want to buy it. It wouldn't be cheap, but at least it would give them the base, you know. Oh, yeah, exactly. We've actually got a pack of um, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. We've got some documentation on the the, the bits and pieces that you need to, to read through, um, some Excel spreadsheets that you can send to your suppliers to go answer these questions. They can then come back and so just some general information, really, on what GDPR nice. is and... Uh, um, some tools for you to look at, some websites to go to. Um, but, you know, the, the, the ones that we provide are based around UK GDPR regulations. Generally, as I say, they're across, the, across Europe and then 90% or 95% the same. But 
there are some slight differences as you get different parts of uh, of Europe. Right. Well, we'll put all Tim's information in the course for his uh, nebulous. What is it? Nebulous dot. Nebulacloud.co.uk. People always people always struggle with that name. Uh, nebula. Yeah, I know it's clouds. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's not a problem. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to put links in the notes down below too for you to check out. You can sign up to be a partner with Dap River. You can buy my PowerPoint for Office 365 Security, which by the way is awesome to buy as a presentation tool. You can rebrand it. You can edit it. You can do anything you want with it. Um, it's 30, I think 30 slides. And I had a professional person help me at the end. It looks real nice. Um, all the other stuff that you guys need are in the notes down below and in the YouTube channel. I think that's it, Tim. Okay, cool. All right, you guys. See you in course number eight. Bye-bye. Thanks all. Bye-bye.